was a tailor once. He lived in a small town, which is well because he himself was a small man, rather fine, old, and small stature. And there was a beautiful sunny spring day, the first beautiful day after the horrible mud season that followed the grim winter. And so he sat with his window open and sang and whistled as he sewed. And he had a fine commission, a lovely coat that was nearly done. And as he whistled and sewed, a merchant lady went past his window crying, Fine jams for sale! Fresh jam made this morning! Come taste my wares! He beckoned the woman, Come, let me test your wares, good lady. He tasted the peach, and he tasted the plum, and he tasted the pins. He said, Give to me, please, a small measure, just a small measure of, of that quince jam. Well, she was not thrilled. She had hoped for a large sale, but you take what you can. And she took his pence and gave him the jam. I mean, slathered it on his bread, but he was so nearly done with the coat. He set the bread to the side and figured that the sweet would be his reward, along with the satisfaction of work well done. And as he continued to sew, the scent of that jam, so rich and heavy, wafted out the window and attracted some unwelcome guests. Before he knew it, there were flies humming buzzing all about the bread. And he said, And who invited you? You did not pay pence for my jam. And taking out a cloth that he would normally use to dry his fingers if they grew sweaty, he smacked at the flies. And turning over the cloth, lo, there were seven of them. One, lo. He said, what a fellow am I, look at that, they'll not trifle with me again, seven, seven in one blow. He said, ah, this is worthy of commemoration, and quickly he took a length of cloth suitable for a proper girdle, and on it he embroidered this legend, seven at one blow. Ah, but then his heart swelled, and he had to go out and show the town, and he put on the girdle and walked out into the square. But you know, everybody knows the tailor. I mean, he's just the tailor. Hey, is my coat almost done? Nice work on that uh, uh, on that waistcoat. You know, I'm going to be seeing you in a couple... Oh, nobody's watching. He says, that's fine. This deed is worthy of more than my little village. So back to his shop he went, and he packed a russet, and he said, now what have I to take on my journey? And he fished around, and he found an old and somewhat moldy, but still viable cheese. And he put that into his deep pocket. And so he prepared to exit his door. Now, he was a good-hearted fellow for all his little vanities. And in the thicket, not far from his doorway, was a wee bird that had got caught in the thorn. And so he gently and carefully freed her and put her into his pocket. Go figure. <laughs> Off he went into the wide world with his legend boldly emblazoned upon his waist, and he passed out of his village and into the, uh, the green between towns, and he climbed a hill. This was further than he had ever gone. He kept climbing, for the day was fair, and at the top of the hill, who should he meet but a giant? Oh, a fearsome giant, uncouth, and with somewhat debatable manners and cleanliness, and oddly enough, terribly nearsighted. And the giant looked at him and said, Where did you come from? Here you may read. Uh, you're too small. Here, and he took off the girdle and showed it to the giant. Seven at one. Now? Blow! Oh, well, I only made it to the second grade of giant school. <laughs> and the giant said, well, really? That's a fine fellow you are. What can you do? And he picked up a stone and he squeezed it until water ran from the interior of the stone. And the little tailor said, oh, yes, sure, yeah, we do that every day, you know, just to strengthen our hands. And he picks up the cheese and... <laughs> And all the way ran out. And the 
giant said, well then, you can squeeze, can you throw? And he picks up a boulder, and throws it up till it nearly touches the clouds, and poof, it falls again, causing great craters. And the tailor says, good shot. Can you throw one so high it won't come down? And he takes the bird out of the other pocket and releases her. She's so ecstatic to see the sun that she thought she'd never see again that she took off like a little arrow towards the sun and was never seen again. And the giant, okay, you squeeze, you throw, can you carry? There's a tree I've got to take home for firewood. Will you help me with it? And the tailor said, of course, I'd be happy to. You take the, the single end, I'll take the big heavy part at the top. So the giant lifts the tree onto his shoulder, and off he begins. And the little tailor looks around and nimbly hops up into the branches and nestles him on a comfortable seat. And now the giant is carrying not only the tree, but the tailor. And so the top end of the tree gets heavier and heavier. And soon the giant says, oh, I'm going to put it down. And the tailor nimbly hops off and says, what, you can't carry this tree? I've been holding it my end. And the giant says, well, we'll come back and get it tomorrow. Why don't you come home for lunch with me? So I says, sure, I'd love to. And off they go to the giant's cave where his two brothers are waiting. And they lay the fire and they sit to eat and they're telling tales. And, and the giant says, why don't you stay the night? And he says, my sinuses are a little stuffed. I guess I can handle it. He says, sure, thanks. I love you. I appreciate your hospitality. And he crawls up onto the giant bed. And the bed is way too large for one little man. So he curls up at one end all tiny and cozy, which is a fine thing because in the middle of the night, the giants think they'll rid themselves of this terrifying interloper. And so grabbing a rough bar of un unforged steel, they smash it down into the middle of the bed, splintering the bed utterly. But of course, the little tailor was up at the head of it. You know, he just went, okay, and off he went back to sleep. And then in the morning, he wakes up and he says, gentlemen, thank you so much for your hospitality. I'll be going now. I hope we meet again someday. Not. Yeah. <laughs> and the giants are like, <laughs> bye, don't mess with us, we won't mess with you, have a nice day. And off he continues on his travels until he comes to a nearby kingdom. And there he hears rumors that the king is in need of certain service, and, and so he wanders towards the palace, but he grows tired, and he puts himself down to sleep in the garden there, because it smells so sweetly of spring. And the guardsman, reading his girdle, seven at one. Wow, these guys have made it to fourth grade. <laughs> Ah, well, there's a man of prowess. And rather than wake him, because, you know, he might awaken Roth, go to the king and say, Majesty, I think we found the solution to your problem. And the king himself stands over the tailor, and when the tailor, you oh, I am refreshed. There is the king standing there and saying, I'm so glad that you're happy. Have you come for the great offer that I have published? Your Majesty, I have indeed. Repeat it to me that I may you know, be certain I know the terms and conditions. Oh, well, the agreement is that if you will vanquish the two giants who have been ravaging our land, then you may have my the hand of my daughter and half of my kingdom. Giants. I do giants. Giants, good. Okay, got it. Right on. Then I will send with you my my, my hundred, you know, household guard. No, 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 I got it. So off he goes up the hill where the giants are. Climbs a tree and watches them. And what are they doing? They're sleeping. Clearly they've had a busy night of marauding. They're sleeping so hard that each time one of them inhales, all the leaves of the trees are pulled off towards him. And then as he <laughs> exhales, the leaves are then blown onto the other brother. And thus the trees are being denuded. And each giant has a new blanket of leaves. Well. The little tailor sees a solution for this, and he grabs himself a couple hands full of little pebbles, some smaller, some larger, and as each giant goes by, he's all... And one of them, quit hitting me! Why aren't you? And he starts on the other giant. Quit hitting me! I didn't hit you. And between...
between hitting one giant and the other and one and the other, the giants, without bothering to actually wake up, take to pummeling one another. They are, after all, brothers. And they uproot most of the trees on that hillside. Fortunately, not the one that little Taylor is in, because God protects fools and madmen. <laughs> and before you know it, they've bumped each other upside the head so hard they've killed one another. And off the tailor goes down the hill to say, Your Majesty, the deed is done, but you might want to send your uh, uh, charcoal burners and firewood collectors <coughs> to uh, resolve the, the debris. Well, now, the king isn't too happy about this suitor for her, his daughter, who is obviously a peasant. So he sets up the tailor yet another two or three tasks that were not in the original agreement. But in the interest of brevity, leave it to be said that the tailor succeeds admirably and is wed to the king's daughter whose opinion was not asked in this matter, in case you hadn't noticed that uh, little omission. And what night, as the tailor slept, she heard him say in his sleep, Boy, finish the pantomimes and then go. The what? My prince is telling somebody to mend clothing? And the next night it happens again, boy, the, dub the doublet and mend the pantaloons, or I shall whack you with the L rod. She goes and researches what is an L rod and finds out it's something a tailor uses to measure. Mm. Well, how has she gotten herself inextricably bound to a commoner? For love has not yet moved. And she goes to her father and she asks for release from this unsuitable. The king goes to his guards and he says, You must rid me of this little tailor. And he bids his daughter, Move your chamber door a bit open the night that they may come in. And perhaps you will have a headache and sleep in your own boudoir this night. And the tailor, hearing this plot, pretends to sleep. would have nothing to do with this task. And so the king decided it was the better part of valor to keep his word. And in time, perhaps, the princess came, if not to love, then at least to accept and respect the clever little tailor who died a king. 